Hello everyone, this is Air, and welcome to the 35th episode of Death Row Executions. Today's story is on Victor Harry Feger, who was executed by hanging under the federal death penalty in the state of Iowa. Before I begin, I would like to give a huge shout out to four new patrons on my Patreon, Donna, Jill, Jell, and Didi. Thank you guys so much for supporting me and this channel. And also a big thank you to all of my new subscribers. We are at 20k. Yay! I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for interacting with the channel and for being kind in the comments and showing love to the ones who open up about very serious and personal topics related to their own lives. Although it is not known when his actual birth date was, Victor Feger was born in the year 1935 in the state of Michigan. His mother became ill and passed away in 1941 when Victor was just six years old. His father was around but became an alcoholic and joined the Navy for two years before being discharged. He was not fit to take care of his son, so Victor moved in with his paternal grandparents. His grandparents, although loving, did not discipline him and allowed him to stay out late in the night and run away without any repercussions. His maternal uncle decided that his living situation was not the best with his grandparents, so sent for Victor to live with him. Before leaving to live with his uncle, Victor stole money from his grandfather and used that money to buy a motor scooter. This was the first time he stole and continued stealing after this incident. He stayed with his uncle for a month and for unknown reasons left to live with his father who had not been involved since he was six. His stay with his father and father's girlfriend was also short-lived and after a couple of weeks he left to go stay at his grandparents' house again. His behavior was the same as it was the first time he stayed with his grandparents but he was eventually caught and had to spend two months at a juvenile detention center. While trying to decide where to live, his caseworker thought the best living situation for Victor would be with his uncle he previously lived with, but his uncle had turned him away because he said his growing family was too large to accommodate Victor. Not liking the living conditions of his grandparents or father, they decided it was best for him to stay with one of his aunts in Lansing, Michigan. He refused to go to school and was subsequently sent to a boy's home. While in the boys' home, he fell ill with tuberculosis and had to be hospitalized for nine months. After his hospitalization, he returned to the boys' home. Five years after his first stint in juvie and now 16 years old, Victor was finally released from the boys' home but quickly got into trouble. It was May and Victor was sent to the Michigan State Prison at Jackson for breaking and entering along with hijacking a car. He did not serve his full sentence and was paroled in August 1955 at the age of 20 with having spent only four years in prison. Upon his release, he was put on probation and went to live with a different uncle. This uncle was not allowed to give any money to Victor if asked, so instead he gave money to Victor's probation officer, who in turn gave a $40 allowance to Victor every week. Not being able to keep on the right track, Victor was sent to prison for the second time after being convicted of car theft. He spent a few years in prison before being released on April 14, 1960. He was now 25 years old and tried to obtain honest work for the first time in his life, but he was not able to keep a job for more than a month and eventually became a drifter. On May 3, 1960, he got his first job as a stalker at Kroger's in Galleon, Ohio, but kept his job for only five days. He made his way to Broadview, Illinois that same month and was able to get a job working in the kitchen at a local restaurant where he stayed for two weeks before being fired. By May 27 that same year, Victor was now in Wisconsin registering at the Milwaukee District Office in order to get help with employment. That following day on May 28th, the employment office set Victor up with work as a janitor and he was able to keep this job for almost a month before being fired again. His boss at the time said that he did not apply himself and a lot of areas were left dirty and untouched. His official last day of work was on June 18, 1960, and with the knowledge of it being his last day of work, he responded to a newspaper ad where a new homeowner was in need of a house manager. He was hired and Victor was in charge of collecting rent and keeping records of all tenants. He was not trustworthy and also drank on the job but the owner felt that as long as he did his job, he should not be fired. 
He was given a chance to continue working, but decided to quit without any warning and stole $55 in rent money before leaving the property he was able to work for pay and live rent-free. By July 7, 1960, he was off to a new state, but before heading off for his bus ride to Dubuque, Iowa, he purchased a 38 caliber handgun from Becker's Sporting Goods Store in Waukesha, Wisconsin for $37. When Victor made it to Dubuque, Iowa, he responded to a newspaper ad for an owner seeking a tenant for a vacant room, so he used a payphone to call her and arrived at 1004 Bluff Street. He made it there before the owner and paid the first week's rent, letting her know that he was an artist and would be on vacation for a month. He was now going by Sam Newman and continued to introduce himself as such to other people. Victor only had less than $10 left in his bank account that he was using for his written checks. The next day, on July 8th, he tried to purchase a used car with a check and wanted to leave with the car, but the salesman refused to let him leave before his check cleared. The salesman was also suspicious that the checks had the last name Feger, but he was going by Newman. Victor's excuse was that as an artist, Newman flowed better than Feger. He told the salesman he would be back the following day with cash, so he took his bad check and left. Instead of returning to the car lot the following day, he went out that night in search of a car to steal. He and a friend by the name of Alex Dupree spotted a young couple who went inside of a movie theater. Victor noticed that the boyfriend threw something in the glove compartment, and when the couple went inside, Victor opened their car door and realized that the car keys were in the glove compartment, along with a wallet that contained his social security card, license, and other important items. Victor and Alex drove around town and then ditched the car but kept the keys and the wallet. It was documented that the following day, Victor purchased some milk and food and was left with only $2 in his bank account. Now low on funds, he continued to go into different businesses looking to get things with his bad checks. Some stores turned him away, but with the bad checks he was able to purchase shoes, a suit, a radio, and a battery. The next day, on July 11th, after purchasing his $40 suit, he and his friend Alex hatched a plan to obtain some morphine and Demerol. They knew a general practitioner would have some on him, so they walked to a local drugstore, opened the yellow pages, and called the first doctor they saw, which was Dr. Edward Bartles, a 34-year-old Navy veteran who was well-respected in the community. They went to a payphone and called Dr. Bartles, but his wife Ruth answered the phone. He dropped the Sam Newman name and referred to himself as Mr. Ed Stevens. Ruth handed the phone to her husband, and Victor cried out, My wife is sick, critically ill. We need help right away, as soon as you can get here. He then proceeded to tell the doctor that his wife just had surgery, was in a lot of pain, and in need of Demerol, which was prescribed to her, but something happened to the medication. Victor gave the address 1134 Locust Street, although he was staying at 1004 Bluff Street. It was around 7 o'clock at night, and Dr. Bartles let his wife know that there was a house call and he would be gone for a while. He left Ruth a note that said Ed Stevens and wrote the address he would be going to. He grabbed all of his medical supplies, got inside of his 1959 Nash Rambler, and headed for 1134 Locust Street by 7.30 p.m. When Dr. Bartles arrived, Victor was outside waiting and informed him that he and his wife were visiting friends when she fell ill and returned home. He asked Dr. Bartles if he could ride with him to his house, and he agreed. They drove to 1004 Bluff Street and made it to Victor's room that was stationed on the second floor. Once inside of the apartment, they made their way to where his wife was, but to Dr. Bartle's surprise, it was Alex Dupree laying in the bed pretending to be the sick wife. Victor then pulled out his 38 caliber gun he had purchased back in Wisconsin and forced Dr. Bartles to get in his car and start driving. The three of them got in the car while Dr. Bartles began driving east of Dubuque. He left his blinkers on, and once Victor noticed this, he threatened to kill the doctor if he did anything else that was suspicious while on their drive. Dr. Bartles began sweating and getting anxiety, and also asked Victor multiple times if he was going to be killed, but did not get a response. They pulled over near a farm, and Victor instructed Dr. Bartles to take any medication in his bag that would help him with his anxiety. He followed those instructions, and then began driving again. Victor later said that he intended to kill him there, but it was not the best location to leave the body. Just a mile after he began driving, they spotted a lot of trees, so decided to pull over. After parking the car, they hopped a fence, 
walked through a cornfield and made it to a wooded area. Victor tied Dr. Bartles up and let him know that he would leave him there and later call his wife and the cops informing them of his location. While they were talking, Alex grabbed the gun that Victor left in the car, walked back and fatally shot Dr. Bartles in the back of the ear. Both men moved his body deeper into the woods, took his wallet, returned to Dr. Bartle's car and headed back to Dubuque. Victor and Alex stopped and had drinks on the way and then made it back to their room they were renting and packed their belongings. After leaving, they stopped at a payphone and by this time it was around 10 o'clock at night. Victor got out of the car and phoned Dr. Bartle's wife Ruth, let her know that he was Ed Stevens and that her husband was still helping his wife who was very ill and would most likely have to stay the night while they called for a specialist. Victor hung up the phone and drove off with Alex. Shortly after driving off, Victor fatally shot his friend Alex, put him in the trunk, and then drove to a nearby river. He dumped the body along with other bloody clothing items that would be considered evidence. He got back into Dr. Bartle's car and headed for Chicago, Illinois. The following day on June 12th, Ruth Bartles had still not heard from her husband and she also received an anonymous call from a man telling her that her husband was dead. She phoned the police who quickly traced Dr. Bartle's last known location. Multiple witnesses came forward describing a man with a stethoscope looking scared for his life as he was walking with a man wearing thick glasses. Another witness who lived in the same triplex as Victor told the police that they left the house at around 8 o'clock and got into a bluish gray car before driving off. Police then got another tip that the man with the glasses was spotted at Holscher's pharmacy using a payphone. That is when police were able to recover Victor's thumbprint that was on the opposite page of Dr. Bartle's information in the directory. While the investigation was going on, Victor made a pit stop in Gary, Indiana and stayed at a hotel using the name J.C. Austin. That same night, police entered Victor's old room at 1004 Bluff Street and found identification from the Wisconsin Employment Office that had Victor's real name on it and they also found evidence that made them believe he had multiple aliases. On July 13th, Victor went to a used car lot in Gary, Indiana and introduced himself as none other than Dr. Bartles. He had Dr. Bartle's identification, along with his car registration, and told the car salesman helping him that he wanted to trade his car for a less expensive one and get some cash back in return. Victor was missing the title of the car, and the salesman later said that Victor spent time looking for it. After some time, he suggested that Victor call his wife to mail the title so they could make the deal. Unable to find it, Victor left the car lot. Victor was spotted a few days later in multiple stores buying things with checks that belonged to Dr. Bartles. He would walk in stores with the doctor's stethoscope around his neck and use his identification as well. He stopped at the Gary service station three times and purchased clothing from pennies. The last store he attempted to purchase something from was at the Bush Jewelry Company. He asked the manager for a blank check to buy an $80 watch, but left after filling the check out when the manager told him he could get the watch in a few days when the check cleared. The manager later said that he did not believe he was a doctor with his dirty appearance and he knew that the address he gave was a fake address. Victor then met up with a man he met randomly in the street by the name of Jack Hord Hale. Jack was a convicted felon who stayed with Victor for the next few days while they drank and forged checks to purchase things. He later testified against Victor during trial and said that he knew Victor was in a stolen car but did not care. He hitched a ride with Victor, so by July 17th, they were now in Holland, Michigan. On July 18th, they drove to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and while getting gas, Jack bought a newspaper and noticed the headline that mentioned a doctor was missing in Dubuque, Iowa that was last seen with a man by the name of Victor Feger. Victor told Jack that his real name was Ed Stevens and that his friend was Victor Feger and he was the last person with the doctor. He said that they went to the woods and when he left the two, Dr. Bartles was still alive. Jack initially said that he did not want to be involved in his problems, but Victor convinced him to help him with stealing new plates. Once they stole plates and put them on Dr. Bartles' Nash Rambler, they drove to Birmingham, Alabama. They broke the original plates on the car and also destroyed Dr. Bartle's identification cards. They checked into the Ancelet Hotel for the night, and the next day on July 20th, they both went to different car dealerships looking to sell Dr. Bartle's car. Victor was eventually caught by the FBI while on one of the lots. 
A few days after being arrested, the body of Dr. Bartles was found 10 miles east of Dubuque, Iowa, which put him just over the state line of Illinois. While in custody, Victor spoke to the FBI and eventually to his attorneys. He was indicted on August 9, 1960 for kidnapping, but it was a federal crime because he crossed state lines and transported Dr. Bartles from Iowa to Illinois. This federal charge, similar to my story on Carol Chessman, made him eligible for the death penalty. He signed paperwork to not attend the hearing and stopped speaking with anyone who had any further questions about the case. The trial began on March 1, 1961 in Waterloo, Iowa, and during trial, the only thing he said was that he was guilty. His lawyers tried arguing that he was insane, so Victor was examined by psychiatrist Richard Stamm. He concluded that Victor was a schizophrenic with a severe paranoid personality. He made notes that Victor was very intelligent, knew his behavior was abnormal, but was unable to internalize self-control, unable to identify acceptable goals in life, and was emotionally detached from others and experienced hyper-intellectualization. He was found to be sane by the court, and by March 12th, Victor was found guilty and was sentenced to death by hanging. He was sent to a federal prison in Leavenworth, Kansas, and on March 5, 1963, he was transported to Iowa State Penitentiary at Fort Madison for the actual execution because the previous prison was not set up for executions. He tried to appeal once, but it didn't go through, and although during that time Iowa had experienced a couple of high-profile murders in that state, they refused to reinstate the death penalty and were against it. The governor of Iowa by the name of Harold Hughes phoned former President John F. Kennedy because he was the only one who was able to grant clemency, but Kennedy felt the crime fit the sentence. On March 14th, Victor spent the night with a Catholic priest for a vigil, and after the vigil, he was given a brand new suit for his execution. For his last meal, he requested a single olive, and as he was being taken to the gallows, which was really the prison's workshop, he told the two guards that he wished for the olive to be buried with him in hopes that it would sprout as a sign of peace. It was before sunrise on March 15, 1963, and Victor made a statement. Well, John F. Kennedy... If you're going to make any sudden moves, you better be quick about it. They did not hear anything from the White House, so they proceeded with the execution. Victor was given a piece of gum, a black hood was placed over his head, and he was eventually hanged. After his death, they removed his soiled suit and gave him a brand new suit that had his olive pit in one of the pockets. No one claimed his body, so he was buried in an unmarked grave at the Fort Madison City Cemetery in Iowa. And now for discussion and question time. Do you believe Alex Dupree was a real person, a hallucination, or a made-up person? The only witnesses who came forward described Dr. Bartles and Victor only. Police also noted that there were only two sets of footprints in the cornfield that led to the wooded area where Dr. Bartles was shot. On the other hand, Ruth Bartles received an anonymous phone call letting her know that her husband was dead. She did not recognize the voice as the man who she previously heard that went by the name Ed Stevens. So could Victor have disguised his voice, or could that have been a call from Alex? Initially, when Victor spoke with the FBI, he did mention Alex, but the interview was not recorded or transcribed, so by the time he was indicted and they wanted to question him more about Alex, he refused to answer any more questions. Do you think it would be beneficial for kids raised in group homes who are also in and out of trouble to get mandatory therapy and or get concurrent rehabilitation? I personally think this would be beneficial because I don't think the chances are high for a child growing up in similar situations to Victor who will grow up being able to ditch those bad habits. I just recently watched news clips of a girl who went viral in the past for driving drunk, killing her younger sister, and recording it for TikTok. She got an early release after spending, I believe, two years in prison, and after her release, she was back in court for driving under the influence and crashing another car. So after prison, she was right back with the same crowd, and I would say that it's pretty hard to be a reformed person with no help. A lot of people comment that they've had hard lives and they are perfectly fine and normal, but obviously there are people on the opposite spectrum who can't break out of their issues without the proper help. 
So I do think something like mandatory rehabilitation in therapy would have been beneficial for someone like that girl. Having the strength to not be a product of your bad environment and getting help to do so before being released and dumped off to continue doing the same things you did before prison seems like a good idea. I do think Victor contradicted himself when he told the FBI that he was intending to kill Dr. Bartles when they first stopped, and then the second time they stopped, he was only going to tie him up. So even if there was an Alex Dupree and Alex actually did the killing himself, that was still Victor's intention. Thank you guys for taking the time to listen and watch another episode. And before I show comment love, I would just like to talk about comments like these. Typically, I just delete them, but almost every day I get new viewers chewing me out for broadcasting their feelings and emotions on me and making assumptions about me. I want to remind everyone that these are stories, and just because you hear a story on Hitler, for example, does not mean they are trying to excuse the Holocaust. I don't see how any rational person would make that correlation. And who's to say all of the information is 100% accurate and truthful, when they open up and talk about their childhood. But many people say things like, how dare I give these killers an excuse by talking about their past, and what about the victims? But 10 minutes later, they are commenting on a different video that they are crying and feel sorry for the killer. This boggles my mind, how frequently it happens, and it only proves that they were watching this video with the mindset of trying to conclude whether or not the killer's actions should be pardoned not me trying to persuade them, because everything they are saying about me are things I have never mentioned in the video. They are the ones picking and choosing who to feel sorry for, who to give an excuse to, and in my opinion, the person she was crying over killed more than one victim, and many could argue that that person did worse than the person she felt I was supporting. I could easily respond to that comment and say, how dare you cry, what about the victims? Just because you felt sorry for her, I'm sure you don't want people to assume that you were negating the severity of her crimes, nor do you want them to feel like you were dismissing the victim. So how is it that I cannot say that to you when you openly say you feel sorry for her, but you get to say that to me when it's something I have never mentioned? Please think about that. That is all for my little rant. I'm sorry to have to include this in the video. Have a good week, everyone, and now for my comment love.